are communicating with us. So we're about to end the little saga here. And we've heard close to eight vocalizations of quiet. I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for him because after I'd had my personal sighting, <clears throat> I spent quite a bit of time trying to make sense of what to do with this experience. Well, it made such a huge impact on me and I, and I knew what I wanted to do and I visited with him for the following week while he was in Florida and I said, I want to do what you do because I think it's that important, this information. And so I've been working for the past five years on getting him up here and, uh, and it is now a reality and so Without further ado, I'm going to introduce Lloyd Pye because you're going to see why he has made such an impact on my life. Particularly for having me here, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming to this event. I know it's always difficult and, and taxing on a lot of people to make the trip, pay the money, do what it takes. But you are all the family of Bigfoot researchers and enthusiasts, and I'm a part of that family. Although many of you don't know me very well, don't know that I've been doing this for the better part of 30 years. I don't do it in the way that most of you do it. I don't do it from the field necessarily. I have been in the field, I have some slides from the field, but mostly I'm, I'm like an academic researcher. We have a term in the South, shade tree mechanic. It's a guy who works on your car out under a shade tree in his backyard. He's not a, you know, doesn't have all the degrees, but he can get your car fixed. And that's kind of what I do. I'm like a shade tree hominoid researcher, Bigfoot researcher, Sasquatch researcher. Just so you all know um, kind of where I'm coming from in that regard. Now, the other thing I want to say is that as a family, we are like a typical family in that we have uncles we really like and we have uncles we don't like. We have cousins we really like, we have cousins we don't like. We get together, at least in the south, around the crawfish, boiled crawfish and shrimp and crabs, and we don't get along, we argue. There's no fun in getting along. <laughs> we get in each other's faces. And I know that's what you do too. And that's the kind of family this is. But we are trying to sell something a belief system that Bigfoot's real, Sasquatch is real, against a, a team, not a family, a team, a well put together, well disciplined, well organized, well coached team. And that team is the establishment of science that we are up against. Anthropologists, archaeologists, but everybody that calls themselves a scientist, has a PhD after their name, thinks we are stupid, thinks we are off our rockers, except for the rare exceptions, like Grover Krantz or Jeff Meldrum. But those guys went into the system and worked their way through it before they had some kind of epiphany that allowed them to completely change colors change their position. Because you cannot get through the system unless you are a conformist. Try to imagine a 22 year old just out of college going into a graduate's program for anthropology and he starts announcing that he's here to learn everything he can about Bigfoot type evidence. He's out. She's out. The system weeds you out until when you get that PhD, you have bought into the program. You are on the team. You have an ideology that you believe. And that ideology is that you are right and anybody that challenges anything you say is wrong. Because that's all you're told. That every teacher that teaches you knows what they're talking about and it's right. And every teacher that taught that person 
knew what they were talking about, and it was right. Even though the evidence of science is that it's nothing but one long series of corrected mistakes. At any particular point in time, believe that they are right, and any, again, anybody that challenges what they say is wrong. Ipso facto, wrong. And that's us. We're challenging them. We're challenging their belief system. And we're not doing it effectively because we don't have an ideology. We don't have an overarching view like they do. That evolution is the way it all works. And that we're all sitting here as the product of very long-term millions of years of evolution. And that there's no place in that for Bigfoot, for Sasquatch, for any other kind of hominoid. They have a nice, neat, precise, tight world view that makes sense to them, and they defend it. They defend it vigorously. If any of you have tried to go up against them, you have found out the hard way. They don't take prisoners. They buckle up their chin straps and they play full speed, full contact. And we wander around like the rabble we are. Because we don't have an ideology that can compete with them. We have a belief, and that's it. A belief in the reality of Bigfoot and Sasquatch. We need a larger view. We need an ideology. Now what I'm going to do here tonight is present to you an option, an ideology, my own personal ideology. Take from it what you will, if, you do, if you're interested, if you want to do that. But I feel like that until we collectively get behind something larger than just the view that Bigfoot's real, Sasquatch is real, and get away from the parochial position that is maintained here in the Pacific Northwest and also around other parts of the country, until we get away from that and start looking for an ideology that can compete, we will stay in little small venues like this. We will be ridiculed in the media. We will not make headway. We will continue to be right where we are, just treading water, a squabbling, dysfunctional family. We need to change. Now, whether or not this will motivate any of you to change, we'll, you'll know in the end of a couple hours. But for right now, I want you to know what I'm going to be trying to do here as we go through these slides. OK. First one, obvious. Darwinian evolution for dummies, the simple, the simple view of it is that everything evolves and everything out there is eat, survive, reproduce, eat, survive, reproduce, and we stand there able to think, what's it all about? What's it all about? Why are we so different? Well, what they say, what Darwinians say, is that just like that, evolution, and we evolve from that one into us, over millions of years, of course, but Evolution, this is their boiled down ideology that they defend. I'm going to now try to begin to present an alternative view for you to consider. All right, next slide. The Miocene, something almost none of you will know anything about. The Miocene era, it lasted from 25 million years ago, somewhere out here, to around 5 million years ago, somewhere around here. But this is the teeth of it right here. The Miocene era. Now. You all would think that monkeys came first. They did. At about 35 million years ago, monkeys began to appear in the fossil record. But they are almost immediately eclipsed when the apes start appearing, the Miocene apes. Now, these are tailless apes, not monkeys, apes, like gorillas, like chimps, supposedly. But you'll notice they are all over the place. And you will also notice that they run, have a good 20 million year run. 20 million years, these guys dominate monkeys. Monkeys have taken over in the last 8 to 10 million years in the fossil record. 
But what it says is that there were an awful lot of them, 22 genera, perhaps as many as 50 to 100 species. They don't know how many species. Like we have two chimps today, chimps and bonobos. We have two gorillas, mountain and lowland. So the, it, there were numbers of each one. Proconsul had like, I think, five or six. And they were all different sizes. They were little bitty ones the size of dogs, dwarf size, human size, and big ones, bigger than humans. And Gigantopithecus, really big. Big as that. Well, this is kind of beginning to droop a little bit. Big. <laughs> big. And though we find a lot of fossils here, and they, they disappear in here, and we don't have any in Africa, where there were so many of them at one time, and then in the late Miocene, we don't have any chimp or gorilla fossils to speak of. That doesn't mean, you know, the old line that they give us, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because you don't find the fossils doesn't mean they're not there. It's very hard to make a fossil. Keep that in mind. Very hard. You have to die under some very specific circumstances to make a fossil. You have to be like swept away in a flash flood and rolled up in the mud such that your body cannot be gotten at by scavengers. Or you have to be killed at the water hole and before you can be fully consumed, something else, a, a herd of wildebeest or something comes to the water hole and stomps you down into the mud so again, you can't be fully consumed by scavengers. That's why there are so few fossils. And it has to do with where you live and what your environment is like at that particular time. Forests do not produce great fossils. You have to be at the edge, out at the edge, because you're not going to be dying at the water hole if you're living in a forest. You're not going to be getting swept away by too many flash floods. You got to be kind of out at the edges. So just understand that it's, it's rare to get fossils, although we have a lot of them, and there are periods in which we have lots of them. But it could be that those Miocene apes have gone on from the beginning, 22 million, 25 million years ago, right on through. They didn't necessarily go extinct didn't necessarily go extinct, but they tell you that they all did. They all did, except for the seven that we have now. The two types of chimps, the two types of gorillas, the orangutans, and the two gibbons and siamangs, the lesser apes. Why would all these guys go extinct? They're living, there's no colossal extinction event like the one that took out the dinosaurs. Why would they go extinct? They're, they're living, for the most part, in forests. They're not living on savannas, you can bet that. If you're not running 40 miles an hour on a savanna, you are a snack treat for the cats out there. That's all you are is a snack treat, if you're not running 40 miles an hour. They are living in trees, they are living in forests where they can scamper up or get away or hide or do something or just in general stay away from the cats. Not that forests and jungles don't have cats. Everybody's got to eat, but they're not as many. They're not as many. So when they, when they are doing all this, when they're living these lives, their environments are not disappearing out from underneath them. They don't wake up in the middle of a forest one day and the next day it's desiccated and gone. When you have periods of change in the environment, it changes very slowly. And if you want to, if you've got half a molecule of a brain in your head, you're just going to go where the, where the environment goes. You're going to follow it. Didn't hurt the monkeys. Didn't hurt the monkeys. So why would it take out all of them? But yet, we're told that they did. Somehow, they all went away, disappeared. Next slide. Now, next slide, finally. The problem with the Miocene is it produced a number of what are called short-armed apes. It produced a number of long-armed apes, but it produced a number of short-armed apes. And they have arms that are more like monkeys than 
the quadrupedal apes that we know today. Now, they are a problem because you have to explain how they locomoted. Because it's not easy to move on all fours if you have arms equal in length to your legs. Now, we have arms that are shorter than our legs somewhat. And the quadrupedal apes all have arms that are longer than their apes, I mean, longer the, than their <laughs> legs, excuse me, in order to move comfortably. In order to move comfortably. So what about the short-armed apes? Well, what they say is, as you see, they, they would travel in trees like the monkeys do on top, on top. But the problem with that is a monkey's got a tail for balance. Take away the tail, this gets pretty hard. Get up over 100 pounds, and it gets real hard. Gets real hard. And yet, and yet, they insist it had to be this way because they can't allow bipedal locomotion in the Miocene because that leads straight to Bigfoot. That leads straight to hominoids. So they leave out the possibility of bipedal walking in the entirety of the Miocene when it screams out that it might have been there because of the short-armed apes. Next slide. Now this is a long-armed Miocene ape. Right, moved from wherever, whichever one it evolved from, right on down, and here it is today. A chimp, obviously, had a hair disease that lost, you know, costed its hair, but you get to see pretty clearly how it moves, how it locomotes. But in trees, because of the long arms, they can brachiate very much easier than could an ape that's this size with arms the same size as the legs because you've got much more weight down here, bigger center of gravity, harder to hang up, and you have to have much stronger shoulders. Okay, next slide. Let's go back to the, now, the, this was the answer when they're in the trees. What about when the long arm, I mean the short armed apes get down on the ground? What do they, well, you see, this is the Darwinian answer that they, they just shambled along like this with their knuckle dragging, with their knuckles dragging on the ground. Now, ask yourself, if you've been doing this for several million years, don't you think one of them says, uh, Ethel, I think I got this far. Why don't I just maybe go up this side and see why I can see a little better here. Wow. <laughs> you know, you would think one of them got the idea to stand up a little bit higher, and then maybe a little bit higher, and then maybe a little bit higher, until, by George, this is better. Come here, Ethel, let me show you what I learned how to do. You know, I mean, really. Doesn't it seem an easy step to go from this knuckle dragon stuff up and become bipedal? Yes. I don't think they did this. I don't think that's the answer. But they, the other side, all buy that. I think it's ridiculous. Next slide. I think this is ridiculous too, frankly. This is the human evolution for dummies. We start out at around four million years ago with Australopithecines. They carry forward about two million years evolving into this, early homos, homo erectus, and they continue on for another couple million years to around 200,000 years ago genetically and 120,000 years ago in the fossil record when we appear, humans. And this is supposed to be a fairly smooth transition over time, one to another to another. When in fact, these are transformations, folks. They're huge transformations. And these guys don't change a heck of a lot in those two million years. And then until these guys appear, appear, just as these appear. And then these, these go carry on for a couple million years, not changing a whole heck of a lot. And then suddenly these appear. Radically different in every case. Radically different. They're not transitions, they are transformations. Transformation. Something happens. Big changes. Next slide. You see Australopithecine right here. Early Homo, Homo erectus. Big, not even human. Big change. Big modifications. Next slide. 
These are the early Australopithecines, the Australopithecine types. Afarensis, Africanus, the famous Lucy, um, Robustus, Boise. A pair of upright walking chimps for all intents and purposes. A pair of upright walking gorillas for all intents and purposes, including the sagittal crests. Upright walking chimps, upright walking gorillas at four million years ago, give or take a million or two, down to around two million years ago. Try to start keeping these numbers in mind. Four million years ago to around two million years ago, give or take. Next slide. The most famous of the Australopithecines, Lucy, 3.2 million years ago. I hope you've all heard of her, at least heard of her. Very complete skeleton, about 40% mirror image. You get, you get a good look at her. Now, one of the things they will do, I mean, there's no question she's walking upright, got the hips, got the knee. Uh, she's upright. She's on two legs, no doubt about it. But what they do to kind of fake you out, part of the brainwashing to make you think about what, make you think what you think about these things is, they make her look as human as possible, always. They make these things look as human as possible. Because why? They get the grant money. The guys that are finding the prehumans get the money. Follow the money. And so they do little tricks like <clears throat> bumping her shoulder up too high here because they got the whole bone here, bumping this one up equal to it, and then bumping this one up a little from this because they want that fingertip to be up around where ours goes instead of down about here where it actually belongs. Vince Lombardi said football is a game of inches. So is anthropology. So is anthropology. Okay? Game of inches. Next slide. Okay, Homo habilis erectus Neanderthal. This is just, these are the, the really sinking in now deep into the prehumans. Prehumans they're called. The Australopithecines are considered prehumans too. Anything at all is considered prehuman as long as it walks upright. That is the hallmark of becoming human, walking upright. They, science keeps that exclusively for us, for us. If it walks upright, it's us. These folks all did, even though they don't look very human. You saw how lacking in humanity were the Australopithecines. They're just as bad. They have the big brow ridges, big round night vision looking eyes, foreheads that slope back. Big, huge, wide nasal passages, four, four uh, jaws that stick off their mouth in the prognath prognathous fashion, and no chins. If you had it here, they'd have no chins. Very, very different from us. Very different. Next slide. This is the best of those folks that we have, best skeleton we have, the Lake Turkana boy, Homo erectus. Now, he's about 12 years old, they say, about 5 foot 8 inches tall already at 12 years old, but what's cool about him is how robust, how thick and robust his bones are. Even at 12, his bones are thicker and more robust than any bone in Arnold Schwarzenegger's body. He was a brute, he was a beast already. Now, because of the shoulder and the full length here, notice how extraordinarily long that is relative to ours. You got the fingertip down pretty close to where it belongs. Kind of hard to hide it. You with it? See, all these little things are important. <laughs> Next slide. Now, what the other side shows us as part of the brainwashing is, every time you get a depiction of these creatures, of any kind of early prehuman, what do you have? A really butt ugly face on a human body. Look how human that looks. They can't argue about the faces because we got the skulls. But we don't have a whole lot of the body bones, and even though we do, as you've seen, we've got enough to know better, they still put them with these slender, human-looking bodies. Next slide. Same thing with the Neanderthals. But ugly face, human-type body. To make you believe they've got it under control, they know the story, and this is how it happened. And for the longest time, Neanderthal was just the next step down. It was just us and them, and you know, pretty easy transition. We know a lot better now. Next slide. Neanderthals are very different. Very, very different. 
So much so that now we know genetically that we probably weren't related. But you still get passionate arguments that we interbred with them and we diluted them and that we carry their traits with, within us. And we could. We could indeed carry a few. There could, I believe there could have been interbreeding, but not a lot. I don't think a lot. But I think the story of Zana out of Russia, which I'm sure you all know, of the, the interbreeding there between humans and an Alma indicate that it is, it is possible, and I believe that it is. But I don't believe a lot. I don't believe a lot. And this shows one of the things about them that was different. They have this huge nasal passage, very different than ours, and they have these inner bones we don't have. No sign of, not even vestigial. A very different kind of nose, a very different kind of creature. It's, I think, safe to assume that you might find these things in many, these are very fragile, by the way, and are very seldom found with fossils, but you might find them in more than the Neanderthals. Next slide. Another look at Neanderthal thigh bone, human thigh bone, Neanderthal fingertip, human fingertip. Look how robust, how strong, how incredibly strong the Neanderthals were relative to us. How do we know that? Because your bone density is a function of the torque that your muscles can generate. I mean, what's the point of having muscles that can out-torque your bones? They're just going to snap when you go to lift something heavy. If you're looking at bones like this, you're looking at something that's very, very strong, just like the Lake Turkana boy. Robust. Not gracile, not human-like, with a butt-ugly head. Not even close. Next slide. Okay, this is a human, um, excuse me, a Cro-Magnon hand, but essentially Cro-Magnons are the early forms of us. This is our hands. And this thumb, this hand, is designed for gripping things like handles on tools and axes, and it's for manipulating. It, it's, it's a different kind of hand than a Neanderthal. Next slide. See the difference? This thumb is good for bracing something in the hand. Bracing and holding and stone tools, hand axes, stone tools. This is a hand designed for it. But also look at the strength in this thing. Look at the size of these bones, the attachments. You saw the fingertip. Powerful, powerful, powerful relative to us Neanderthal, the one right up, going right up against us and overlapping with us. Next slide. This is to show that a Neanderthal hand had fine grip capabilities. Of course, yes. We all have that. Things have got to eat. They've got to be able to pick berries off bushes. Sure they can do that. They use this to say, well, see, their hand was as good as ours, as flexible as ours, so it's a very human type hand. Now, next slide. Look at the chimp. He can do that. Chimp can do it. It's no big deal. No big deal. Next slide. Pre-human versus human skeletons. I want you to I want to spend a little time on this. Pre-human versus human skeleton. Okay, something happened in here. These guys just go big jump here. Look at them all. They have just what you saw in those pictures. Again, they have big round night vision kind of eyes. They have big heavy brow ridges. They have foreheads that slope back off their heads. They have long arms, especially long from shoulder to elbow, that bring their fingertips down around their knees. They have a squeezed in musculature up here that creates these kind of upside down triangle rib cages because they need more muscle to lift those heavy big long arms out so they develop a bigger girdle in here. And then you have us with our shorter lighter arms and so we have more, less muscle up here and we have the rounder rib cage. Completely different. Now it's hard to tell in this drawing, and by the way I didn't do any of these drawings, these all come out of textbooks all come out of their textbooks, but the neck is hard. You see it's a little extended relative, but it, it's hard to see the difference. But, next slide. The necks are really different, really, really different, because we can assume this is a chimp, but you saw in the pictures of the Australopithecines and the, the um, Homo erectus, it looks pretty much the same as this. 
So you have to assume there's that huge jump from the pre-humans to humans. There's a, there's a major overhaul in here that allows us to, to do what? To speak. To speak how? To modulate words. Not to say that they can't make a wide range of noises. They can. They may even communicate among themselves. But what we're able to do is break those sounds into little bitty pieces. I mean little bitty pieces that can become words. But these guys, major overhaul, they can swallow and breathe at the same time and not choke. Well, we try that, you're going to be blowing the milk and the peas out of your nose. <laughs> right? Big, big change here. Next slide. In fact, these are, there are 12 ways minimum in which humans are not, not primates. Not primates. Our bones are much thinner and lighter. Our muscles are five to ten times weaker, pound for pound. Our skin is not well adapted to direct sunlight. Our adipose tissue, we have ten times as much, that's the fat under your skin. You cut us deeply and severely, and, and the, the cut's just going to open because of the fat, and it isn't going to heal without stitches, and we're going to, could well get infected and die. You cut them up pretty bad, they're like a horse. It'll go back together and heal, and, you know, everything has that that ability to self-heal but us. We've got that fat. Body hair missing, patterns reversed. We don't have a lot of body hair relative to primates and the pattern is completely reversed. Now figure this out, why? They're thick on the back and light on the front and we swapped it around. Heavy on the front, light on the back. What selective advantage is there to that? Why would nature bother? Okay. Head hair and nails must be trimmed. Now, what were we thinking? Where's the advantage in that? <laughs> Just to give the women something to complain about? My hair, my nail, you know? Sorry, I'm just you know I'm just teasing. But you get the point. That was not a good move. That was not a good move by Mother Nature. It's better to just have, like sending the kids to school in a uniform. Everybody looks the same. What are you complaining about? Everybody looks the same. We could just, you know, if all our hair ended at the same length and our nails and you know, just, that was a good thing. Why'd we give it up? Skulls and brains, not in the same ballpark. Not even close. Locomotion, most obvious difference. And primates, remember. Speech, we just saw. Throats completely redesigned. Sex, no sign of typical estrous cycles. Genetic disorders, we have over 4,000. Very few among them. We have over 4,000. What were we thinking? <laughs> How do we do this? And most of all, we decided to give up a couple of chromosomes, a couple of whole chromosomes to become what we are. We ought to have about 20 more, it would seem to me. We're so much better, so much more sophisticated in so many ways, supposedly. How do we drop two and do that? Next slide. Okay, we're going to start now with my personal predictions that I'm going to use as a kind of a means to give you the, the ideology that I was talking about. You know, part of the game of science is predicting and then seeing if it comes true. Stick your neck out on the line. Go ahead, make some predictions and see what they say. See what, can, see what comes of them. Here's my first one. The so-called prehumans are non-extincted Miocene apes. Apart from their bipedality, they share no basic characteristics with humans. None. That's what I say the prehumans are. They are not prehuman. They are post Miocene ape. They're just Miocene apes living on like they've done for the previous 20 million years. No breaks in the action for them. And we just happen to find their fossils. Now, apart from the bipedality, that's a big point. The bipedality. Is it the same as ours? What is it? I mean, do, do they walk like us? No. Next slide. <clears throat> Let's talk about it. We know they walk, the Australos walked upright at three and a half million years ago because we have a trackway from Laetoli in Tanzania. What happened was a volcano erupted, laid down a, a bed of ash, a pair of Australopithecines at three and a, whatever was alive at 3.5 million years ago, we assume it was Australopithecines. They were walking upright. We know Lucy walked upright. We add two and two. This is what we get but they left their tracks. 
rained a little bit, sprinkled, set them, another ash flow came in, and they're set for the next three and a half million years until they're discovered in 1978. And we have it, next slide, we have it here, the trackway. Got it? Now this is a close-up of one of the prints. Now, you'll hear a lot of different comments about this. There are some, some that say it's very, very human-like, and others say it isn't very human-like, but it's clearly at three and a half million years ago, you've got, you've got to have room to evolve. You've got to have room to develop. So you wouldn't expect a foot of an upright walking creature at three and a half million years ago, ago to be nearly as sophisticated as ours because over three and a half million years you're going to get a lot of changes. Okay, so, but that's it. Next slide. This is a human foot stepping off, just we all know how this works. Heel strike, roll through the arch around, come off and press off with the toes. We all know that. Next slide. Here's it graphically. Come down, heel strike, swing it around the arch, cut over into the ball of the foot, which is your thrust generator, out the big toe and the others are, are balancers and thrusters slightly. Everybody got that? Next slide. This is a photogrammetric analysis of the Laetoli track with a human track. And this is just looking at the pressure points and pressure ridges in it. Now, I'm sure you all can see what I see. It's pretty different. It's pretty different. It's very different, in fact. Very light heel strike relative to this. Very light strike up here, but the two equals about this right here. And then it toes off here on the ball and out the toes, but it toes off here sort of behind the toe, base of the toe, but right in that area. And it, the ankle is set up here as opposed to right here. It's a very different foot. It's a very different kind of locomotion. Next slide. Here we see it rework so that we see where the ankle is, we see where the human ankle is, and we see the force areas, the, the push here, the, the heel strike here, the great reduction in it. You know how this thing's walking? It's laying its feet down almost flat, flat. It's not boop, it's not thumping down the way we do. It's not locking its knee, it's not, it's not thrusting forward, it's not <coughs> It's not walking like us. It's walking a little more like the, the Groucho Marx thing, like shuffling along very quietly, very, very smoothly. Smooth down, smooth up, smooth down, smooth up. And steady, very steady. Next slide. In fact, here we see it again. We have hours, which causes a, a kind of a rotation as we throw. If you look at very slow motion, time and motion studies of walking, we're, we're bobbling, we're, we're not steady, we're not smooth. And over time, this, this movement through our feet wears out our lower joints. We're not walking as well as we could or should walk. These guys are. This is a very smooth, very steady, very clean. You could just keep motoring on this and not wear out very much. It's very smooth, very different. And most importantly, folks, understand this, it's better than the way we walk. At three and a half million years ago, the Australopithecines are walking better, efficiently, more efficiently, better biomechanically than we do today. Today. But I say they've had 20 million years to work on it. And so they got it right. By then, they had it right. That's what I say. Next slide. Again, that's these guys, might have been this one, could have been this one, or a different one, that left those tracks three and a half million years ago. Next slide. Moving into these, now, we know that the heads change pretty dramatically, but why would the feet change? Would the feet change if you're already, if you've already just got it knocked, if you've got it wired at three and a half years ago, at three and a half million years ago, why are you going to change? Why are you going to, why are you going to do anything? Nature's not supposed to do that. It's supposed to get something right and stick with it. So I think these guys probably had the same kind of feet and were walking the same kind of way as the ones at Laetoli. Next slide. They needed some improvement in this head, and they got that. But I don't think they necessarily needed improvement in the feet. Next slide. Same thing again. I think it was a, a series of transformations that led to this rather than transitions. And as those transformations occurred, 
I don't necessarily believe it happened in the feet, as we are told that it did, that we went from their feet to our feet. Their feet were better. Next slide. Second prediction. Again, sticking my neck out. You can come with me if you want. Stay back if you want. The so-called pre-human stride is nothing like a modern human. They are so far apart in foot morphology and locomotive style, no reasonable comparison can or should be made. My opinion based on my years of research in this field. Take it or leave it, basically. Next slide. Okay, now, let's move into hominoids, what I call hominoids, and I do it a little different than you folks. I use that term to talk about the collective group of creatures in the world that are Bigfoot, Sasquatch, but others. You know the classic Patterson, Gimlin film, but there are, and these are, of course, the big ones. Eight to ten feet tall, 800 to 1,000 pounds big. But you also have the abominable snowman yeti type, more man size, five to seven feet tall, 300 to 600 pounds or bigger. You have another kind, again, represented by the drawing of a Bigfoot, but still, let's just call it an Alma, an Alma, because the Alma picture I've got didn't fit on the slide. It was uh, kneeling down. But let's just call it man-sized and dominant, dominant in Russia, again, five to seven feet tall, 300 to 600 pounds in that range. And then we have the small one, again, another, another drawing, but it just fit the slide, but let's just call this one the Agagwe Sadapa kind, the dwarf kind, the four to five feet tall, 200, 250 pound-ish, the small one. And let's talk for a moment about the hobbit from Indonesia, because in all likelihood, that is one of these. It is just simply a Sadapa Agagwe type of hominoid. Because why, if any of you saw the 60 Minutes piece, you saw the poor guy sit there and say, yeah, yeah, there's nothing about it that's human except that it walked upright. So we have to call it human, because pre-human, because, you know, it was there only like 17, 18,000 years ago. You talk about stuck between a rock and a hard place, no, no pun intended. These guys really are. They have to call it human, even though there's not a human bone in it, and they know it. They are stuck. Next slide. Let's go back now and remember that we have all of these guys coming out of the Miocene. They're there. We know that Gigantopith Gigantopithecus came out fairly soon, about five to eight million years ago. And they, we know that they range from China to India. Next slide. Here we go, some different Gigantopithecus jaws, and this is the big one, the big one, and that's the one that Grover Krantz took here, a gorilla, human, next slide, and fashioned a head to go with it. Now, even though it doesn't have nearly the kind of canine that a gorilla has, Grover went ahead and put a gorilla top on it, but it could be somewhat modified from that, and it could look maybe a little more like this, not necessarily like that, but it was just Grover's interpretation. Grover was a classically trained anatomist and very much believed in evolution, and so he, he believed that it was one of these, and it, it could have been, but it could be other, otherwise. Keep that in mind. Next slide. This is Bill Munn's Gigantopithecus reconstruction based on the evidence of just the jaw. It's all we really have, but notice how much it looks like what we imagine a Bigfoot would look like. Next slide. Now, hominoids walked onto page one in 1951 when Eric Shipton, a very famous British mountaineer, took this series of photographs on the Menlong Glacier in the Himalayas and it just took off. The abominable snowman was part of the culture. Now, there's a good set of tracks. Next slide. This is a foot molded after those tracks, designed, and if you, if you look at it, you think, man, that's ugly looking. Who, who could walk, who could do anything? Biped or gorilla, uh, bipedal or uh, gorilla or anything, gonna be tough. Not so, not so. If you're just living on mountains and, and 
always on steep ground, never on really flat ground or hardly on flat ground, that's a good foot to have because you're, you're constantly working. You've got an edge. You, you can stand on like two inches and make it. This would be like, a, you know, you ever see a bighorn sheep and mountain goats and things? They can stand on like that. This is a good foot to have if that's where you live. And this seems to be the only place that they live. The abominable snowman yeti type doesn't seem to be found anywhere else except the Himalayas. But together, the Himalaya ranges comprise an area as large as the United States, so, you know, they've got plenty of room to roam. And very few people live in there with them. And that's another thing. Next slide. We want, you know, people say, well, how could, the, how could all these hominoids be out there around the world, four types everywhere, where you have reports from every state, you have reports from every continent except Antarctica. How could they be there? Humans are everywhere. And what we are taught and what scientists for the most part believe, except those who are involved in this research, is that the, the whole of it, the whole of the Earth, has been sort of, sort of sampled and looked at by, by at least somebody. So in reality, that's not true at all. Most recently we found that if you take away the tundra and you take away the deserts, what's left is called, quote, arable land. That would be prairies, savannas, grassland, lightly wooded areas, heavily forested areas, jungles, swamps. And if you take it that way, half of it, half of it, we, we fundamentally don't inhabit. We fundamentally do not inhabit half of the arable land out there. They used to think it was 45-55 our favor, but really the most recent that I've, that I've seen is that it's not really that. Satellites indicate that it's still more like half and half. With all the cutting down that's going on, with all of that, still about half and half. There is plenty of room out there that's basically terra incognita. Uh, basically terra incognita. Just not well known, not hardly inhabited, hardly trekked. Fully one quarter of the United States, this may surprise all of you, one quarter of the United States has never once been foot surveyed. Never once because it's just too hard to get in there and do the work, even for surveyors, and that's a hardy crowd. The world is not what you think it is and not laid out the way you think it is, not the way you're taught, not the way you're told. I mean, you live in a state right here, Washington State. How much of this state do you think has actually been foot surveyed? I'll bet you there's whole swaths of it that nobody's ever been into. It's just too hard. Next slide. The panda's a classic example of what I'm talking about. The panda story. The panda was the Bigfoot Sasquatch of the 1800s. Word kept coming out of China of a black and white bear that ate only bamboo. Vegetarian bear. Well, every, I mean every, so-called expert in the world that knew anything about bears said, well, you have white bears, you have black bears, you have brown bears, but you don't have two-tone bears and they're all omnivores, they eat anything. They don't specialize in leaves of any kind. So, ipso facto, we can tell sitting right here in our desk that this is all wrong. Totally BS, the Chinese don't know what they're talking about, they're seeing things. And then in 1869, a French naturalist got one. Got one, brought it in, got it to Paris, and the world knew, knew these things were real. And so every museum and major university in the world mounted a field, a, a, a research team, put them into the field in Sichuan Province, China, which is about the size of your state here. Sichuan Province, China, about the size of your state. Very rugged, mountainous terrain like you have here, covered wind bamboo forests, just like your forests, but otherwise the same bamboo forest. And they were just attacked by well funded, well-equipped search teams to be the first to bring in that next panda. How long do you think it took? How long do you think it took? These are good woodsmen. These are people like Bob Gimlin. Lots of them back then. 60 years. 60 years. Now, you, you say, well, you, you've got to be exaggerating. Yeah, I am. They quit after about 30 and said, well, it was just a fluke has to be extinct now. And then 30 years later, Teddy Roosevelt's sons were over there doing some hunting, just hunting, you know, and shot one out of a tree. And they knew it was real. 
So then they crank up that machine again, but they had learned a lot by that point. And over the next 20 years, they brought in a half a dozen. And you want to do a good screenplay. I used to work in Hollywood. You want to do a good screenplay. Guess who got the first two? A woman. A woman named Ruth Harkness. Great story. All these macho men out there, you know. <laughs> and she goes out and she nails it on her first try. And boy, there is so much sour grapes. And it's, oh, you got lucky. Oh, man, you got lucky, lucky, lucky. Next year, she does it again. Stuffs it up their nose. Man, I love stuff like that. <laughs> Take this. Boy, I love that. Anyway, the panda. Now, what's the panda doing? Why, why, what is the panda doing to be so wonderfully elusive for 60 years? Well, you, you see the deal. It lives in a green world, and it's, it's colored black and white. Lives in the daytime, easy to spot. It's out there, living in the daytime. Got to eat, got to move. Slow moving, not fast. You've seen them in a zoo. Stupid as a bag of hammers. I mean, just dumb. Can't even have sex and reproduce hardly in a zoo. We are not talking smart, intelligent, fast-moving, nighttime living creatures. We're talking nincompoops. Now, compare that to Sasquatch, Bigfoot, and any other hominoid. Compare that to monkeys. Chimps or gorillas. The, what was the problem? The problem was with us. It wasn't with them, it was with us. We think we're great in their environment. We suck in their environment. And that proved it. That proved it. And we're the same in the environment of any hominoid you care to name. We suck in their environment. We think we're great. We think we're masters of all we survey. As I just showed you, we don't even survey all we claim to be masters of. I hope you're getting a very different worldview out of this because I've got a very different worldview than what I was taught. And I think you should too. Next slide. Okay, let's get back on hominoids. You all know this carving, you know Renee. Let's go over again. All hominoids, whether it's the big kind, Bigfoot Sasquatch, whether it's the abominable snowman Yeti or Alma, whether it's the Agagui Sadapa, they're all described essentially, fundamentally, the same way. Receding foreheads, big brow ridges, big round eyes, big wide pressed nose across the face, mouths that stick off, prognathus, no chin, necks cocked down, big thick muscles, big long arms hang, hanging down to the, the knee area, big width between shoulder and elbow, thick muscles, covered in hair from head to toe. Now, take away the hair and what did I just describe? Next slide. Those guys, the prehumans, the prehumans, the prehumans are hominoids. They look like them. They're like everybody describes them. And, they, and science will tell you, well, that doesn't count because it's anecdotal and it's just stories. It's case histories. It, you can, just like, like Tom was saying earlier, you can use that. And you should. Prehumans, hominoids. Human, different. Different. Next slide. Now, we just go through the quick proofs that we use. We all know these. I'm just going to buzz through them. The famous Patty. Next slide. The Minnesota Iceman, and we were talking last night, Lauren was talking earlier about the penises, and, and when I was a young man, I saw this, and I had absolutely perfect eyes, great eyes. My dad was an optometrist for like 40 years, and he said I had the third best pair of eyes he ever saw. I had some eyes, and I saw this in my prime in about 73, 74, somewhere, I'm not sure exactly because I didn't know I would be into this, but in that range. But when I saw it, I was already interested in this field. Got interested in it right out of college, so I was interested. And I paid my buck and a half or whatever it was, and I went through three times. And I saw it. And I'm convinced it was the real deal. I don't think it was a fake. I, you could see it laid in there. The water let the hair float up off the body. Long hair, about three, four inches long round, each hair was round, fatter than a normal hair. You could really see this. 
almost like porcupine quills or something. And it, and it had uh, striping kind of on it, and every hole where it went in the body, every hole was perfectly circular. And you could see that the knees were cranked up to the surface almost, so you, you could really see if you had good eyes. If you, if you had bad eyes, if you just had a magnifying glass, you could see. Every hole was perfect. When you punch hair into a wax anything, you've got a tool. You go to Madame Tussauds Museum and you can see it's a little tool that'll punch the hair in. When you pull it out, it leaves a little nick. Round hole, nick. Round hole, nick. You look at this, perfectly round holes. Real hair growing out of real stuff. But the bullet wounds, the hole in the chest, the hole through the wrist, the, the blown out left eye, the, the right eye, the sack of the right eyeball sticking out. You could see all this. And more than that, what you can't see in this drawing is that the, the wounds, all the wounds and the corners of the mouth were bleeding a plasma blood mix. It was pink. You know how you scrape your elbow and you get that, that plasma and the blood kind of mixing? That's kind of what it, where it was when it got in there and, and the water was put on, it was frozen. And those ribbons of blood and plasma went up from every, every wound out of the nose, out of the mouth, out of the corners of the mouth, out of the two eye holes, out of here, and out of here. And they went up to the surface of the ice and spread out and made circles about like that. About like that. And had little bubbles trailing up through them, little whatever that meant. Little bubbles. I believe this was real. I'm convinced this was real. Next slide. The Albert Osman story, we were talking about that. Uh, Lauren was talking about it earlier. Next, next slide. This is the Alma picture I was telling you, representing Zana, the famous one from Tekina in Russia that lived in the village for 40 years and produced the eight offspring, four of which lived to maturity and whose grandchildren and great-grandchildren still live in Russia to this day. You talk about a documentary screaming to be made, crying out to be made, I've got a Russian friend in London named Andrew, and he has got connections in Russia, and he is a filmmaker, and he is just dying to do this. He can make it happen. But again, and I'm sure Lauren and anybody else here can tell you, to get the money for a documentary is hard just to begin with. To make one about something like this, it's so volatile. But it's unfortunate because it's a great story, crying out to be told. Next slide. This is the skull of her son, youngest son, Kvit, which I think looks significantly Neanderthalish, heavy brow ridge, sloping forehead, uh, big, big nasal opening. But it does have a human, though heavy, a human jaw because it has a chin. Grover thought this was just a, um, we, we got in a kind of an argument about it. Um, Grover thought it was just a variation on the human theme. A very, well, tell you what, I'm glad I never played football against that variation on the human theme. Because I think he could have ripped my head right off my body. It's just my personal feeling. Next slide. Okay, prediction number three. Hominoids are planet Earth's only indigenous bipedal primates. They have lived for millions of years on every continent except Antarctica. For all I know, they might have lived on Antarctica at some time. But I'm, this is what I'm going to say for prediction number three. Again, trying to form an ideology here that we all can get behind as the larger picture, the bigger picture. Next slide. OK, let's talk about the proof of their existence in the tracks. Now, let's go back to what's different about them versus us. Again, this is a, a standard Bigfoot track. It has a widened heel, an extended heel. It has an ankle centered up sort of in the middle area here. It has a shortened forefoot. It has all the toes about, about the same size, but in a different kind of arrangement that we have. They are like separated by a medium here all the way, indicating that their foot works fundamentally differently than ours does because ours would have this flattened out right through here. You'd have a heavy heel strike. You'd have the momentum through here into the ball of the foot and then out through the toe. What you have here is a line of momentum settling. You see there's no real deep heel strike. It's the same as this. You can almost see this part hit, this part hit all the same, and the line of motion is straight up. It's balanced. It's centered. It's more stable. It's better 
then we walk. To this day, from the three and a half million year ago print to this print, they're still walking better than we do. Walking smoother, walking more stable than we are. Next slide. A different one, different kind of foot, different kind of toes. These are the peas in a pod type. All toes the same size, basically, but still that separated ridge indicating that the toes are working differently than ours. This one would be squashed through, squashed through here. There, it's toeing off, on, not on the toes, but it's thrusting off, rather, on the forefoot. And again, the same thing, the extended heel, the widened heel, the ankle in the middle, the shortened forefoot, the widened forefoot, and the nice smooth tread through the soft down, soft up, soft down, soft up. Not soft when you weigh six, seven, eight hundred pounds. It's not what I'm saying. Not light, soft. Soft. Boom, boom, boom. Hitting smoothly. Next slide. Now, this typical Bigfoot Sasquatch stride, and as you see, the gentleman, if, if we were out like faking it, clunk, clunk, like that to try to get the width, but yet, as you see, they're nice and smooth, and, and they continue on. Nobody's faking that. Nobody's carrying a barbell on their shoulders, getting the right depth and getting the right shape. Next slide. Bigfoot walks better than us. Again, I've said it a bunch, but again, here's why. Around here, this, this swinging of the torque around our arch and around here into the ball and out is just not as efficient, not as smooth, not as clean as that, in my opinion. I think it's just a better walk has been from the beginning. Next slide. Now, this is Grover's foot analysis, and he said that if you figure, you know, if you work on it, that you get a 31% increase versus 23% here. So it's this much of an increase, ankle forward. This is out of his book. Okay? Next slide. This is the ankle position of the Laetoli tracks. Again, just to remind you, ankle up, Heel widened, the different, it's very similar in its own way, very similar to the way a hominoid walks, to the way Bigfoot walks, isn't it? Pretty easy to see. Next slide. This is Grover again, showing how thus the Sasquatch foot at a given stature has just to trace over twice the surface area of a human foot. Next slide. And we see this famous picture, I think, of Roger Patterson's foot with the Sasquatch from Bluff, Bluff Creek. We see that comparison that we just saw. Next slide. Now, we see a couple of other Sasquatch tracks, Bigfoot tracks, hominoid tracks. Now, anybody recognize these? They look a little different because they come from clay in a floor of a cave. But does anybody recognize where these come from? where these hominoid tracks come from. Torriano, Italy, right. And what are they? They are Neanderthal tracks. Neanderthal tracks. They are considered to be Neanderthal tracks because they were in a cave and they had Neanderthal artifacts around and they are considered to be Neanderthal tracks. And yet, what do they look like? Smaller versions of this. In fact, they think maybe it was a male and a female as were the tracks at Laetoli three and a half million years ago. 30,000 years ago, three and a half million years ago. Male and female again. And guess what else? Does this one look familiar? Next slide. Three and a half million years ago, 30,000 years ago. Australopithecine, Neanderthal. Pretty doggone close to the same. Is it not? Is it not? So, if we can make the case, if we can make the case that Neanderthals were hominoids right up to us, then you can also make the assumption that right on through down, right on into the Miocene and right on out, hominoids. Upright walking bipedal apes up to 
in my opinion, Neanderthal and through Neanderthal up to Cro-Magnon. Next slide. Turns out we have, of all things, complete Neanderthal feet. No other pre-human do we have the complete feet. We have complete because they buried a few of them toward the end. They may have picked up burial from Cro-Magnons, or Cro-Magnons might even have buried some of them. But somebody buried them, and we have their feet. Here we go, human Neanderthal. Take a look. Look at the heel, the extension, versus the human. The settling of forward of the ankle relative to that. And look, this is where you really see the difference. Look at the stability and the width of the forefoot, the shortening of it and the widening of it. And understand, you're looking at muscle going all the way around here. You're looking at a big, thick foot with a lot of muscle prepared to carry a very heavy body through a lifetime of hard use. Look at our skinny little foot by comparison. And look at the, look at the curve. Look at the wobble. You can see. You can just see that sway that we have. Look how steady, how solid, how right up the chute this guy is. Better, 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 better is better, better than us. And balanced. Look at the difference, how dominant, how dependent we are on our big toe as opposed to balance. A different kind of foot, a different kind of lo locomotion, very different. From the beginning right through most recent one we have. Next slide. Comparison of Neanderthal versus hominoid. Look, pretty close. Pretty close. Next slide. Now, the face of Neanderthal. This is what we are told, for the most part, the Neanderthals were all about. But I put it to you that it's very likely that, in fact, Neanderthals look more like this guy and they look like that guy. Hominoids. Now, this is the ideology, next slide, that I'm trying to, to put forth here. Prediction number four, the fossil record from Neanderthals back through the Australopithecines contains nothing resembling a human. They are the bones of hominoids which will prove to be apes that walked out of the Miocene era. Now, as of right now, I'm probably the only person anywhere saying these things. I'm the only person I know about saying these things I'm saying to you here today. But I believe that if not in my lifetime, in the lifetimes of some of you, or the lifetimes of your children or your grandchildren, in the end, I am going to be right, and every damn one of them is going to be wrong. Every damn one of them is going to be wrong. I believe that. I'm going to go to my grave believing that. And I may see it proved before I die. But I know what we're up against. I'm very aware of what we're up against. We're up against a team, and we're a dysfunctional family. We're going to have to make some major overhauls in the way we approach the way we do business to have a dog's chance to succeed against these folks. They play hardball. We play jacks by comparison. OK, next slide. I'm now going to take you off the deep end. For as radical as what I have said up to now might seem to you, we're now going to plunge off to the deep end. Because why? If humans are not pre-humans, or pre-humans are not, don't lead to humans, if they're really hominoids, what are humans? What are we? How do you account for us? The way I account for us is this. Let's go through the lesson real quick. From macro to micro in five steps, the human body contains 100 trillion cells. There is a nucleus inside each human cell except blood cells and sperm cells. Each cells. Each nucleus contains 46 chromosomes arranged in 23 pairs. One chromosome of every pair is from each parent. The chromosomes are filled with tightly coiled strands of DNA. Genes are segments of DNA that can contain instructions to make proteins the building blocks of life. There will not be a quiz. Just want to kind of go over how it breaks down. OK, next slide. Targeted gene replacement. This is what we are in the beginning stages of really learning how to do. We're getting pretty good at it, but we've still got a long way to go. 
But what our guys can do now is take chemicals that will cut through gene segments and splice them out and put other things in there and see what results. And when you get really good at this, you can do virtually anything with any living thing. You can mix and match to your heart's content when you really know what you're doing. Let's, let's, we've got some hunters here. Let's just, for example, let's think what if we wanted to hunt, if we wanted to create something that could really hunt, what would, we'd, we'd want to create an animal that was really, really fast. So let's model it on a greyhound dog, really fast, what do they run, about 35 miles an hour, 40, mi 40 miles an hour, but you've got some pronghorn antelopes and things out there that can go 40, 45, so let's boost it, let's supercharge that sucker, let's, let's put him up to, let's get a greyhound up to 60 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour. Let's do that by lengthening its spine a little bit and making it extra springy so that his rear feet, when he comes up, they don't hit kind of close to his front feet. They hit way out in front so he can really power along. Now, we got ourselves a fat, but a dog doesn't have a killer instinct, does it? They've got to have a cat's killer instinct. Cats do the killing. So, now, let's, let's give him a greyhound body, but let's give him a cat mentality to hunt. But, at 60 miles an hour, what problem do we have? Turns, high speed turns. Can't have a cat's feet because you've got those soft pads and retractable claws. We've got to keep the dog's feet on there. We've got to keep the hard pads and the, the extended claws. So we got to, but we can do it. We can do anything we want. We mix and match and we can make ourselves a real great hunting animal that's a mixture of dogs and cats, right? Next slide. Oh, we already have one. We already have one. A cheetah, ladies and gentlemen, will run 60 miles an hour and absolutely overtake anything on a savanna. It is a domesticated cat, it's called. One of the very first domesticated cats. History going way back as hunting animals. And guess what? They are a blend of cats and dogs. See their fur? The tan part's what you find on a short-haired dog. The black spots are cat fur. See the feet? Dog. See the body? Cat. See the spine? Extended. Stretched out. Let's it run 60 miles an hour. Big heart. Extra lung capacity. Super lungs. High speed turns. Absolutely a mixture of dogs and cats susceptible to diseases that only dogs get and susceptible to diseases only cats get. More importantly, and perhaps most significantly, they're all clones, genetically exactly alike. What's that mean? It means cheetahs are a product of genetic engineering. No question. Yet science insists they all came out of a genetic bottleneck of some kind. That's how it's explained, seriously, a genetic bottleneck. Somehow, all the cheetahs, all the creatures that led to cheetahs, died, except for a very few breeding pairs, somewhere, over the last few thousand years, and they radiated out again to the wide areas they cover now. A bottleneck, a genetic bottleneck. It's the only way to explain something that otherwise is inexplicable totally inexplicable. Now, supposedly cheetahs go back millions of years, like everything else, but as far as domestication goes, we know they've been domesticated the last 5,000 years. They were the one of the first ones, going back to the Egyptians and Sumerians. Absolutely one of the very first ones. Okay, that covers the cheetah. Now, this slide covers a lot of things. Domestication is one of the great, untalked about, unexamined mysteries of the world. That goes for wheat, corn, cattle, goats, sheep, anything, and us. Charles Darwin himself said, when you come down to it, humans are more like domesticated animals than anything else. Now, put that aside for a moment. Here's the story we get for wheat and grain and corn and cows, all domesticated plants and animals, this is what we get. Let's start with grains. Somehow in the Stone Age, some bright guy, thousands of years ago, 10,000 years ago or more, looks out of his cave one day and says, you know, 
If we were to go out there and pull up some of that grass or cereal or grain and bring it into our cave and pick through the little seeds that look like pepper flakes, if you've all seen their seeds, pick through and pick out the biggest ones and plant those and task our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and for the next couple of thousand years, if everybody keeps doing that same thing, pulling out the biggest seeds, eventually we're going to get big seeds that we can actually deal with. We can actually harvest and eat. And if we get lucky, if we do all of this for a couple thousand years, if we get lucky, maybe some miracle might change the biochemistry of those seeds and turn them in from things that we absolutely cannot use to some kind of a seed that, that our bodies can use. And furthermore, the way they're designed at the Rachel's and Glooms will allow us to harvest them and get them back somewhere and thrash them and we can get those seeds out. Everything about this has to be changed and that guy stood there at the front of his cave and somehow he had this vision and somehow he was able to pass the word down for hundreds of generations and everybody did it and somehow we wake up one day and we have all these things, domesticated plants. Same thing with the animals, looking at the big wild oryx, just a real bad news thing, looking at a wolf and saying, oh yeah, let's bring those in and keep those for several generations and breed the wildness out of them. Yeah, there's going to be some nipped ankles in the cave here for a few generations, but if we stick with it, we're going to get a dog and it'll be really fun. They might have puppies and it'll be fun. You know? To so totally absurd. So totally absurd when you just think about it for five minutes. And yet that is totally bought, paid for, signed, sealed, and delivered by every major botanist that I know of. Nobody says these kinds of things. Nobody that I'm aware of. But yet it's there. A, a child should be able to see it. And again, so with humans, just like Darwin said, we seem to be like domesticated animals. Next slide. Cerebral cortex comparison. Now, evolution. Rat, if you take the cerebral cortex, which is the outside part of the brain, the outside covering, most closely related to intelligence, this part out here, and you peel it off and you spread it out, of a rat it's about the size of a postage stamp, of a monkey it's about the size of a postcard, of a chimpanzee it's about the area of a sheet of typing paper. And for us, it's four sheets of typing paper. I submit to you that this is not evolution. This is something happening. This is supposedly our closest genetic relative. Something happened genetically to do this. Something happened. It's clear something happened. That is not evolution. But what? Next slide. Okay, again, I want to remind you, the 12 ways humans are not primates. Bones much thinner and lighter, muscles 5 to 10 times weaker, skin not well adapted to direct sunlight, adipose tissue 10 times as much, body hair missing pattern reversed, head hair and nails must be trimmed, skulls and brains not in the same ballpark, locomotion most obvious difference, speech, throats completely redesigned, we saw that slide, sex no sign of typical estrous cycles. Now let's focus on these last two for a minute. Genetic disorders. We have over 4,000 and counting. 4,000 genetic disorders in our gene pool collectively, meaning you can find gene these 4,000 genetic disorders from Eskimos to Watusis. We all carry on average about 250. You may have 200, your wife may have 100, but if you two carry the same one, each of your children has a one in four shot of expressing it. Now, the key to this is simple. In nature, you just don't have that many. Faulty copies are done away with. Faulty products are done away with. Most things breed very true in nature, plants and animals. There are very few. Things like albinism, you'll find that in gorillas and alligators. And, you know, I mean, and al but it being an albino doesn't kill you. It doesn't really stop you from reproducing, so you can bring that kind of a, that kind of a gene flaw into the gene pool. But we have a couple of dozen 
that kill you dead before you reach the age of puberty. Whatever. You can't pass it on. There should not be a single one of those spread through the gene pool. Why? Because how did it get there? If it can't be spread through sexual reproduction, what's it doing there? It's there because of genetic manipulation. That's what all 4,000 of them are there for. Genetic manipulation. And mistakes were made and left because whoever was making the manipulations didn't care. Didn't care to get it right. They just were hurrying to get the job done. And so they left. Did they care if they were making something? Did they care if it killed one in 10? Did they care if it killed one in 100? They not care. If they're making sentient beings like us, they're doing it for a reason, and they're not doing it for our benefit. They're doing it for their benefit. Same with domesticated plants. Same with domesticated animals. We're no different than them. Somebody came here and designed this planet to suit them. And we are a product of that program, whatever that program was. That's what I believe. That's what I would like you to consider as a possibility. Next slide. Three primates and a human. Remember three baby, three men and a baby, three primates and a human. You have the human, chimp, gorilla, orangutan. And you know, we always hear this from the other side. Well, gee, it's, all, it's so much the same. It's so much uh, DNA, so much the same. Geez, there's just, just a little step from them to us. Surely we evolved from them. Surely we did. But you know, we're an awful lot like a mouse, too. Awful lot like a rabbit. But we are a lot like other primates. What's the difference? Well, you know, it looks pretty much the same, doesn't it? But there is a difference. They all have 48 chromosomes, and we have 46. Remember, we lost the two chromosomes somehow, some way. But guess what? That's an awful lot of DNA. That's an awful lot. How could we? be even as close as we are, and we're wildly different from them, but how could we even be as close as we are if we lost two whole chromosomes? Guess what? This is the big secret they don't tell you. We didn't lose them. We didn't lose those two chromosomes. Guess what? Guess what? Next slide. Somebody fused them. The second one. The second one, somebody took number two and number three on the primates, and in us, fused it together. Why do you suppose they would want to do that? Keep the whole chromosome package there, but turn two into one. Why? What if they wanted to breed us with something that had 46 chromosomes and breed us regularly to them? and create an offspring that way. They would have to combine the package and reduce it from 48 to 46 without losing any of the DNA. And that's what they did. That is what they did. Next slide. Prediction number five. Humans are not native to planet Earth. Along with domesticated plants and animals, we have been genetically engineered by outside intervention for unknown purposes. Now, this is the big one. This is the one you may not want to jump off with. This is what I believe, and this is what I believe is going to be found to be the truth downstream. I don't know how far it'll be, but I think the evidence is jumping out all over the place right now, and nobody wants to look at it because, again, this is going to be have, have to be crammed down some very unwilling throats. But it is the truth, and it will come out. And whether I see it or not, you will remember that you were here tonight and heard me put it out together in this package for the first time. Again, as far as I know, I'm the only person anywhere saying these things, but I believe that I'm right, and I've taken my time, and I've worked on this, and I've worked on it for a very long time, and I think I've got it in the bag. And I offer it to you today as a kind of ideology to maybe start wrapping your minds around 
and maybe start swinging behind because if we can start pushing a fuller agenda other than, other than Bigfoot's real, Sasquatch is real, Bigfoot's real, Sasquatch is real. You see, it's just, it's not effective. But you lay out a whole program and saying, you know, we think this worldview can supplant your worldview. We're in a ball game. We're in line selecting equipment. We're getting ready to go out on the field and play. We're no longer a dysfunctional squabbling family. Take Let me close tonight will. by Again, thanking you all for being here and sitting through this. I hope it hasn't been too scandalous for you. I hope it hasn't been too upsetting for you. But I feel like it's time to put this kind of information forward to the family. And ask for what we used to have, like in my family, family council when you really needed to talk something over serious. To have like a family council meeting where you get to air out some maybe radical opinions about you know, who's, who's carrying their weight and who isn't in the family and who's causing trouble and who isn't and all that. This is sort of the same thing. I think it's time for us, if we can, if we can, to rally around a larger idea, a larger view. It may not be my view. You may have others who will come before you and present their views. And you may choose that instead. But until we gather around some central theme that is larger than our own parochial interests at the moment, we are defeated. We have no chance to compete. But if we do this and we do it right, make some good decisions, pick some things we all can believe in, and get behind and promote, we can beat these guys. Because we've got right on our side. They think they're right, but they're wrong. People 300 years ago thought the Earth was the center of the universe. They thought they were, but they weren't. People right now believe that we are the biological center of the universe. We're just as wrong today as they were then. And it will be proved. It will be shown. I may not be 100% right in everything that I've told you here today, but I'm a heck of a lot closer to the ultimate truth than anybody out there on the other side right now. I'm sure of it. And I hope that at least some of you will agree. Thank you.